All right, we are in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I hope you got a Bible. If you don't, you can grab one of the pew rack in front of you. Uh, we are continuing an Easter series called His Mercy is More, uh, heading up to Easter, to, uh, heading up to Good Friday and the cross and then, then Easter and the resurrection. So uh, that's this, this week. This is Passion Week or Holy Week. And uh, today is Palm Sunday. Uh, I, I don't have the palm branches out for you. I'm sorry, but uh, it is Palm Sunday. Um, and I, I know my kids came home with some palm branches last week from uh, Children's Church, so we've kind of extended that over, right? But Palm Sunday is today. It's when Jesus makes his, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So we're going to be reading that account and uh, learning what we can see from that. But we're, again, continuing this th- series uh, called His Mercy is More. And, and we, we began it looking at the, the sin we have inside of our own lives and our, our own heart and how, how uh, widely separated we are from God because of that sin, that, that our sins are great, our sins are many, and it separates us very far from God, but His mercy is more. And His mercy is extended to us through Jesus Christ, and He makes a way through the cross for us to, to bridge that gap and come to Him in faith and be saved from that sin. Uh, we also looked at the, uh, the, the fact that there's nowhere else we could go. That, that, that is a mercy in and of itself that God has given us. His mercy is more in the fact that he has given us the answer. He has given us himself that there is a way. And we thank God for the way that he has given us to life. And it's not just because, it's not, it's not like a bummer. It's not just uh, uh, saying, saying Jesus is exclusive, is, is controversial. But it is, it is a rescue mission. It's a rescue plan. We see that Jesus has rescued us in that way. And we are to, uh, to follow him. And he has given us access to himself. Um, then last week we looked at the mystery of Christ in us, that that was a mercy he's extended to us, that, that God has given us his spirit and it dwell, he dwells inside of us. And he want, he, he, we're encouraged to let, let Christ dwell in our hearts richly. And that means moving into every corner and renovating every nook and cranny and, and really, really exposing us for who we are and then letting him have control. I talked about it in this way uh, last week, the idea of the mystery of Christ in us and dwelling in our hearts, that he shouldn't be a tolerated visitor at our house and, and it, we may have fun with him for a little while, and it's exciting, but as the time wears down, we're like, can you leave now so I can get my jammy jams, right? I want to get my pajamas. We need to be able to, to let our hair down, not worry about the makeup, and be in our pajamas in the midst of Christ, because he's staying there. It's not our house, it's his house now, and, and we're going to let him renovate, and we're going to let him be the, the master of the house, and we're going to be submissive to him. And in fact, him, him being head of that, head of, our, head of our heart, head of our home, is a mercy extended from God. Today, we look at the gift of God, the gift of God as, as a mercy of God, right? His mercy is more, and he's given us this great gift. On this Palm Sunday, we see his triumphant entry. And we see this in Romans. And Paul, Paul encouraged us in Romans. He says, listen, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, right? The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're looking at the gift of God today. And, and as we look at gifts, I, I, I want you to think about gifts, how, how wonderfully special gifts can be, and also how wonderfully plastic they can be. You think about the gifts that you might be given at Christmas or for your birthday or just, just whenever. I mean, I, I, the ones that I've received that I've, I've cherished the most are deeply thoughtful gifts, right? Ones that, that I was somewhere with someone and I saw something and I said something and, and they just banked it in their memory. They're like, he likes that. Or he, he would love this. This, is, this would mean a lot to him. And, and, and you just bank that memory, right? And then eventually later on, someone gives you that gift and says, hey, listen, I remember you saw this and you said something and, and I, I, I got this for you. Right? How deeply thoughtful that is, right? It wasn't just a gift card. It was, or, or like how uncles do, or you know, grandma and grandpa's will put some cash in an envelope. Here you, and, that's, and that's deeply thoughtful, obviously. Sometimes you don't know what the kids want. Or, but, but the thoughtful gifts are so important. So deeply thoughtful, personal gifts, right? You, you heard me say it. You saw my, my eyes light up about something, or, 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 and, and you, you gave, gave a gift. The other ones are ones that you made with your own hands, right? Special things that were, were not, not only just made, and oh, here's my trinket I made that someone else might like it, you might not, but it was, I, I thought about you, I, this seemed like you, and I made this for you. I, I went out and bought the materials. I cut the materials. I sanded the materials. I stained the materials. I made this especially for you. Those are gifts that, that hang around, right? They're literally, like they're hanging on my wall at my house. The ones in plastic wrappers that got off, bought off the shelf, maybe not so much. They may end up in the yard sale box. 
But gifts that are so important are the ones that are personal, thoughtful, that, are, that cost, cost some blood, some sweat, some tears. I know I love to make craft things, and I, I'm a woodworker, and I'm not very good at it, but I, I love to do that. And I, I know that the cost is deep on my fingers sometimes, right? I get slivers in my fingers all the time. I may, maybe I need to wear gloves, I don't know, but I, I do. Or in my hands, or you're smelling the varathane, and you're kind of getting a buzz in your head. It, there's some cost involved, right, when you're making things like that. Those are some of the best gifts, though, the ones that really cost something. Not just, not just real expensive things. See, a lot of people can buy something really expensive that doesn't really cost much. But the ones that cost the most are the ones that were thought-filled, right? Sacrificially searched out and researched, and then that what would, what would this person love? And then they're given. And we'll see that today, the gift of God. I want us to highlight that. I say that as a preface because as we look at the gift of God, it was not just this whimsical, oh, it's a gift, maybe we can go shopping for it. He gave us, at great cost, the gift that we all need. And that's what we'll see today, because His mercy is more. So I'm going to pray for us, and we'll get started in our passage in Luke 19. Father, we're so grateful to be here today, to, to look to Your Word, to study it. Got to let it sink down deep in our hearts where You dwell. And God, we ask that You would dwell there richly, that You would renovate our heart. You to open it now to be receptive to your word. You would challenge us from your word. You would convict us of sin. God, and you would move us to a place of obedience and repentance and submission to the Father. We thank you for the opportunity we get to come together, to gather as the body of Christ, united in worship of Jesus Christ. It is all about him. We ask that you would guide us, that you would direct us, that you would be in our midst. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. When he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany and called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter, you will find a young donkey tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. Uh, and they were untying the donkey and its owner said to them, why are you untying the donkey? The Lord needs it, they said. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their clothes on the donkey, they helped Jesus get on it. And, he was, uh, and as he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. Now he came near to the path of the Mount of, the Mount of Olives, uh, and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice uh, for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, If you knew this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst, because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. So that's our passage today, and uh, it's, it's showing us this amazing gift of God as he comes into Jerusalem. And I, I think there's a few things we can see today uh, as we look at that. Uh, so we're looking at the gift of God, and, and number, number one, what we see here today is this, that the gift of God is undeterred. He is undeterred. You think about that, uh, he wouldn't be stopped it is the undeterred, mercy-filled mission of God to save sinners by His blood. That's, that's how He's not undeterred. And you know, He wouldn't be stopped. And, and I talk about gifts and making gifts. Um, I, sometimes I get stopped before I even start. I have this awesome idea that it's going to be great cost and it's going to take lots of hours. And as I, as I get that in my head, I'm like, whoa, I just I can't do it. It costs too much. It's too, too big of a project. T- I'm taking too much on. And, and oftentimes it stops me before I even get started. Jesus did not stop. The the mission that he had to rescue and save sinners was to go and die. 
That is the, the, the highest cost anyone could pay. That is the largest, heaviest burden anyone could carry. And he still, in God's great mercy, as a gift to us, was undeterred. And his trek even started in Luke's gospel in chapter 9. He, at chapter 9 is the point where he turns towards Jerusalem and, and says, this is where we're going. We're going to go up and, and I'm, I'm going to go and die. That was his mission. But although his mission may have started or his journey may have started there towards Jerusalem, we know that the mission of God to save sinners was in place before the foundations of the world. Let's look and see what it says in the first part of this passage in Luke 18. We're looking at verses 28 through 35. When he had said these things, that is, he was just told a parable, and, and, and just previous to that, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. So these wondrous miracles had just taken place, and these parables and teaching, and a large crowd had gathered around him. They were following him into Jerusalem. Now, during Jerusalem, this is a, the Passover week. There, there's millions of people coming to Jerusalem. There's likely hundreds of thousands of people crowding around him on the journey into it. It's a big crowd. When he had said these things, he went on ahead, up, going up to Jerusalem, and as he approached Bethpage and Bethany, uh, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples and said, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying it, uh, its owner, his owner said to him, uh, why are you untying the colt? The Lord needs it, they said. And they brought it to Jesus. It's, it's interesting here, as Jesus goes towards Jerusalem, he is undeterred, right? He is, he is heading towards Jerusalem. He's walking that direction. He knows he's going to the cross. But, but as, he, as he goes, and, and as you look at the prophecy surrounding Jesus, and maybe you looked that up on your own this week, uh, there's so much involved in every aspect, every detail of his approach, every detail of the days and the times and the ways that he's approaching and what happens in, in the middle of it. In fact, this colt, and riding in on the colt is a prophecy fulfilled in Zechariah 9.9. 9. We see that, 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 that he would ride in on a, on a young colt of a donkey. It was a, it was a donkey that he would ride in on. It was a humble, lowly way. But he's undeterred in his mission. But he's also, there's no, there's no distance or knowledge that's far from him. Nothing is too far for him to see and, and to do and to accomplish. He, he knew before the foundations of the world everything that had to be put in place. He wasn't just whimsically heading to Jerusalem into the unknown. He knew exactly what would happen as he went. We see in John 1 I, this idea of the foreknowledge. You, you, well, you go back to the, the text that we read here. Uh, he says, go in, go in. I haven't been there. Jesus hadn't been to Bethpage. He said, go in. And there you're going to find what? You're going to find a donkey that's never been ridden before. And you're going to untie it. And they're going to ask you, why, why are you untying the donkey? And tell them the Lord needs it. And then they're going to let you have it and bring it to me. All of this foreknowledge that he has, all of this, this, this picture, he's like, this is exactly what's going to happen, exactly what you're going to find. Go and get it now. See, this is, this is God who has condescended, condescended into human, uh, humanity and knows what's ahead. Not only is he undeterred, he has this foreknowledge and insight and this, this total knowledge of what's happening. So he sends him in. It's much like when he encountered Philip and then Andrew and Nathaniel. Uh, and in John 1, Jesus uh, had, Philip had gone to see Nathaniel and under that fig tree, right? And, and uh, Nathaniel was a little bit skeptical about Jesus. And he says, come and see. And on his way, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming. This is in John 1, 47. He saw Nathaniel toward him and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now, a previous sermon in the Harmony of the Gospels really expounds this. And you might go check that out if you haven't seen it or heard it. But remember, Jesus had a knowledge about what he was even thinking and dreaming up underneath this fig tree. Nathaniel was skeptical, right? But Jesus knew he was because he's God and he'd be undeterred in the mission. And he knew and he said, here's truly an Israelite within there. Uh, there is no deceit. And then he, Nathaniel said, how do you how do you know me? Because he's God, right? How do you know me? And Jesus replied, before Philip called you and said, come, come and see, right? When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. It wasn't just like I, I, I was in the distance and I, I saw you over there. I was hiding, but you didn't see me. I saw you. He's like, I, I, from far away, I knew where you were. I knew what you were thinking. I saw your heart. That's the God of the universe, right? Here with us, Emmanuel as Jesus. And then how does he answer? He says, Rabbi. He calls him teacher. 
He's like, I want to sit under your authority. And he says, Rabbi, and Nathanael replied, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. And, and again, that, that message will give you a little more depth here, some thoughts, but we don't, we don't really know what he was thinking under that fig tree. We can imagine based on Jesus' response, but something had happened in his heart under that fig tree that Jesus knew and saw. In the same way Jesus knew and saw Nathaniel under the fig tree, he knew and saw that donkey would be at Bethpage. He knew and saw what, would, what they would say and what they would have to respond. He knew ahead of time because he's God. The same way he knew Nathaniel, the same way he knew the donkey, he knows you. And he knows me. He sees our heart. He sees our need. And he has decided to be undeterred in his mission to be the gift that we all need. Time and space can't get in his way. Well, in the way of what, we ask? That's what we see in Luke 9, 21. He strictly warned them to tell no one, saying it is necessary. Here's the what. His undeterred mission. It is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. This was the mission of God. This is Luke 9 when he started turning his eyes toward Jerusalem. He said, this is what's going to happen next. He would be undeterred. And he went on to say, uh, then he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it even benefit someone if he gains the whole world, yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of, that of the Father and the holy angels. Now listen, th- this passage here, this, this what is his mission? What is the undeterred mission? It's to die for us. But this is about the glory of heaven and the requirements of the glory of heaven. And what was it? To lose life, to save life. And we see him as being the gift that would lose his life to save our life. But we also see him being the example and telling us what, it, what it's like to save our lives. And it means to lose our lives. You see, the gift that he was was not just, just the gift on the cross. He was also the example set before us of how we would have life and have it abundantly here before heaven. The gift of God is mercifully undeterred. Amen? Aren't you glad that he didn't stop? Aren't you glad he didn't didn't say, uh, no, not worth it. For the glory of the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Number two, the gift of God we see here is, is exalted through humility. The gift of God is exalted through humility. So, and I've, I've mentioned this before, this, that the, the deeper the contrast, the, gl- the greater the exaltation, the greater the glory, the greater in view it should be, right? When you, when you see, and you've, you've seen this before, you get, maybe you get two different gifts, right, at Christmas time or your birthday, and one's one of those, like, uh, maybe not really thought out, thoughtful, just kind of like obligation, and it's a, it's a something. And the other thing is like, whoa, this is the thought out, amazing, you, you see the contrast there in the gift, right? Now, we, we understand the heart behind those two, and, and that makes a lot of it. That's what I'm saying, a thoughtful gift. Uh, when, when you get a something or another from, from the de- depths of a heart, it means a lot. And the same is true in a, in a costly gift that's made just for you. It's still from the heart. It means a lot. But the contrast is great between what is superficial and what is of great cost and of great value. The contrast is great here. So we see this contrast is great because Jesus is exalted, right? He's glorified. He's lifted up. He's elevated, not through power, but through humility. Now, this is the God of the universe and has every right to take power, to seize power, to express his power. And typically in our own lives, that's what we'd see everywhere. We'd see people taking power, exerting power in order to increase their power. What does Jesus do? He continues to lower himself. He continues to humble himself. So let's see, let's see the passage here. Uh, we see verses 35b uh, through 40. So he just brought the colt to him. It says, after throwing their clothes on the colt, uh, they helped Jesus get on. And as he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. And now he came to the path to the Mount of Olives. And the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice uh, for all the miracles they had seen. This is more about them seeing miracles, experiencing miracles. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. 
Now, I want to stop there before I get to verse 39. You, you see this, this idea, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, what do the people want? They want exaltation. They want power. They want, they want to have a ruler who's going to usurp Rome and get rid of these weird teachers of the law. They want someone who's going to reign for them right now. They have nothing about eternity in their hearts. Right? They've seen miracles. They've seen power. They've seen signs and wonders and teaching. And they're like, here he comes. Here's the king. Get ready, Jerusalem. He's going to shake it up, and you are going to be overthrown by our king. They're excited. They're ready. They, they want to see this happen. But that's not what happens. He comes in a lowly state, right? Think about Jesus' triumphant entry here. Um, it was humble. And, and his, his humble entry was much like his humble birth. Both were attended by lowly people, and it was ignored or ridiculed by the nobility. We see in Jesus' birth, uh, when Herod learns of this, he's like, I want to kill him. Let's, let's figure out how to kill him. And others in Jerusalem, just they, they were kind of disturbed and ignored it. But the lowly came. The lowly of heart, the humble of heart came and observed and were there. And you see this in the Pharisees here. The Pharisees' response in verse 39, all these people are praising Jesus. They don't want that. They don't want his power to come in and, and usurp their authority. And, and, but here's what they know. There's hundreds of thousands of people here. What are they going to do? They can't go and, and tell the crowds to stop. There, it'd be a mob. So what do they say? They approach Jesus, right? They said, uh, some of the Pharisees of the crowd told him, right, Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. So he didn't, they didn't have to go and try to stop the crowds. They went to the leader and said, tell them to stop this. This is, this is not good. This is blasphemy. This is, this is, we need this to stop. I know you know that. Just tell them to stop. And what, what did he res- respond? He says, he answered, I, I tell you, if they were kept to keep silent, the stones would cry out. The stones would cry out. I, I, want, I want us to get this picture, though, and, and understand what, what's going on here. Because we, we think about, and, and we do see where stones and trees and rocks will clap, clap their hands and cry out, like they'll worship God, they'll exalt him. But this cry is a little different. We're going to see it in a few minutes when we go into this, this condemnation part where, where he weeps over Jerusalem. Well, what's happening as he comes into Jerusalem, even though it's under false pretenses, the crowd is worshiping and praising him and giving him glory and credit, it's elevating him. And what it's doing is it's elevating the judgment on everyone else. You see, whether it was him to become a king or him to be the, the eternal savior of all, he came to a city who did not want to receive that. He came to a people who would reject him. Why? Well, because he was there to judge. He was there to condemn. He was there to clean house. And we'll see one of the first things he does is clean, cleanses the temple again. He did it early in his ministry, and he's going to do it again during Passion Week. He's there to clean house. He's there to expose hearts, and people don't want that. So the worship and the exaltation of Christ is, is showing full, full force. There is judgment to be had. And what he says here is that if the people keep silent and I'm not exalted in that place of, of honor and judgment, the stones will cry out. And the word there, the cry, is like scream. They will scream out that you deserve judgment, that I deserve judgment. They will scream out against you, not just in exaltation of Christ, but against you and against me. See, there's judgment to be had here. But God's mercy is great in the humility because the judgment, although there's judgment to be had and he's rightful to judge and he's rightful to rule and lead and usurp, he humbles himself, riding in on a donkey, not a great, great mule or a steed, a donkey who'd never been ridden before, a young donkey. He didn't even have his own saddle blanket, right? The disciples had to throw their coats on it for him. He humbly comes in in judgment. But what he humbly continues to do is take the judgment that we deserve, the, the judgment they deserve, and he took the judgment and placed it upon his shoulders. We continue on, we see that Jesus is, is not the Messiah that they're hoping for. He was there not to establish a, a new kingdom right there on earth. He was walking in, riding in, walking in, coming to Jerusalem, to his death. And the same crowds that were singing praises to him. Listen, this is, this is where the disconnect happens. He, he humbles himself so far 
to not exalt himself with power. He humbles himself to the point where by Palm Sunday, they're, they're worshiping him and praising him. By Friday, they're screaming for his execution. The same crowds that worshiped him on Sunday were calling for his execution on Friday. Listen, he had the power. He could have taken, taken his power and, and usurped everything. But that's not what he came. He came to seek and save the lost. We see this in Philippians 2. We would adopt the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. He said, I, I'm, I'm God. I'm, I'm God in power and in knowledge and wisdom and strength and might. I could do whatever I want, but I'm not going to exploit that. Instead, he emptied himself. By assuming the form of a servant and taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the of death, even to death on a cross. So he died. He came humbly to die. And it says, For this reason, then God highly exalted him and gave him the name that's above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, this is that, that humility that, 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 that through which he's exalted. And that's the gift of God. It's not just, I'm going to come as the gift and be powerful. I'm going to come in the, as a gift and, and using, using my own power and will uh, and the will of the Father, I'm going to humble myself and become obedient to death for you. And then I will be exalted by the Father. I'll be exalted through humility. What did he do? Well, 2 Corinthians shows us in 5.21, he, that is God the Father, made the one, that's Jesus, who did not know sin, to be sin for us. This is the humility. He said, I, I can come in power. I, I don't have any sin. There's nothing for me to be judged about. But I'm going to come in, and, and the judgment that you deserve, that I deserve, Jesus said, I'm going to take that judgment upon my own shoulders so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Through faith in Christ, we might have a righteousness that is, is not of our own, but of Christ. It's this exchange. He came and humbled himself to exchange our filthy rags for his clean ones. Because he's perfect in every way. It reminds me of uh, a couple of things. It, 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 the show, I don't know if you've seen this before, uh, it's a show called Dirty Jobs. Right? And Mike Rowe hosts this show, and, and people send in their, their uh, thoughts about what a dirty, like a, a garbage man or a, a sewage plant treatment cleaner, right? So dirty, gross jobs. And what he does, the show, he goes to those places, and he takes on for a day or a couple days, takes on that job and that role, and he says, teach me how to do it, show me how to do it, let me get my hands dirty. And I tell you what, he gets dirty. That's the, that's the allure of the show. He gets dirty, but, but it's amazing how many people say, sign me up. For a dirty job. I'll go. I'll do the hard work. I'll do the work that no one else wants to do. It reminds me of what kids do these days or what we did, you know, even a couple of years ago. It, we call it, uh, you know, we say, one, two, three, not it, right? One, two, three, not it. I, like, there's something hard to do, something like, I don't want to do that chore. One, two, three, not it. Or, or now today, it's nose goes, right? And when you say nose goes, you put your finger on your nose, and the last one to do it, they're the one that has to do it. It's like drawing the, drawing the short stick. We cast lots for the dirty jobs, don't we? We're like, oh, this is a really tough one. Who wants to do this? And we draw straws. Jesus willingly took on the dirty job. Jesus willingly did the work of humbling himself, of dying a death that he didn't deserve. He died in a, in a place on a cross that we deserve to die. He did the dirty work so that you and I could come to him and have life. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 53 with me. Isaiah chapter 53. Kind of in the middle of the Bible, a little, maybe a little to the right. This is a, a passage of Scripture that, that really shows us this humility and exaltation happening. That what God's rescue plan was for us. And, and we need to see that as this great grand mercy that God extends to us as He humbles Himself. And I, I looked at a couple of verses. I said, I'll read verse 11 and 12. And then I looked at verse 10 and verse 9 and said, you know what? We need to read the entire chapter 53 together. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
He grew up, this is talking about Jesus, he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like some people, uh, he, he was like, some, like someone who people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore, so all of that he was rejected, rejected, despised, cut off. Yet he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains. But we in turn regard him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. You see, we all uh, like, went, went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, and who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was, uh, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as a spoil, because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and intercedes for the rebels. You see, th- this passage is a, is a prophecy about Christ's crucifixion. It would happen hundreds of years later. But Christ fits that to a T. That's talking about Jesus. It's not talking about Jesus coming in power to wipe everyone out. He's coming in humility. To be despised and rejected, to be beat up, to be spit upon, and ultimately to be crucified. But then he rises to life to give us life. And that after his resurrection, God exalts him to the place and prestige and power that he deserves. You see, Jesus didn't do, just do this uh, because he drew the short straw. Right? Jesus didn't, didn't come in mercy because of the short straw. God's mercy was shown in Christ as he was sent. Right? God sent his son. John 3.16, God loved the world in this way that he gave us his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So he gave us his son. He sent his son. And, and God's mercy was shown in Christ as he willingly laid down his life. We see this in John 10.18. Jesus says, this is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so I may take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my, my father. You see, he suffered great humiliation to extend his mercy to us. And that is why he has been highly exalted. And that's why there's this great contrast. It wasn't coming to get power for power's sake. Powerful. He was exalted because he came in God's mercy and died. For us, And as he died for us, it wasn't just a, a choice or some choice. That, oh, that, that's a nice guy. Maybe I'll follow his teachings. It was the only way to God. It was through the death of his son and the resurrection, bringing power over death for us. He was exalted through humility. Finally, the gift of God, number three, condemns unbelief. The gift of God condemns unbelief. We'll continue on in our passage here uh, back in Luke 19. Looking at verses 41 through 44, the rest of the uh, section. It says, As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, If you knew this day, what would bring peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come 
uh, on you when you, your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone uh, on another in your midst. Why? Because you didn't recognize the time when God visited you. This is, this is amazing rejection. It's, it's brilliant rejection, like, like in, in this contrasting rejection. And here's, here's the way, talking about this gift and the idea of gifts that we get, I want you to think about the, this, this rejection and think about how personal it is and how, um, how, how seen it is or evident it is. Think about a gift maybe you've been given and, and maybe you're in a relationship with someone and, and uh, you know, think about high school days or, or early college. You, you were with your boyfriend or girlfriend and, and you know, they, they shared, oh, here, take my, my, my best sweater. You, you, you wear my sweatshirt. You know, we want to kind of do that or you're my, my, my letterman's jacket or whatever it is. But you get a sweatshirt from someone, right? And it's like, oh, this is nice. It's comfortable. It's, it smells like them. It's just awesome. Well, then something happens. There's a breakup in, in, in the relationship, right? And then that sweater is like, no, no, you, go ahead, you can keep it. You can keep it as a, as a souvenir, as a, as a keep. And, and think about that, though. What does that remind you of constantly? That, that gift becomes this glaring, glaring thing in your life, whether it's for good or bad. It's this glaring thing in your life. I think about stories you've heard where maybe there was a split or a divorce or something happened in a family where, um, where the grandparents were, were trying to communicate with their grandkids or their kids and trying to build a relationship or rapport. Or maybe, maybe there was a hardness of heart that said, I don't want anything to do with you. So, but they kept writing letters. You see these stories, right? They'll write letters and letters and letters and, and they'll send them and keep sending them. And they, what happens? Someone, someone that's bitter or angry puts them in a box and doesn't deliver them to who they're intended to be delivered to. Maybe for years that happens. These kinds of gifts are these glaring gifts that sit on the, on the shelf and like, that's something I need to deal with. That's something that kind of exposes my own heart. That's something that exposes uh, some, some flaw in me that I, I need to take care of or something I need to address. I want you to think about that in our, in our relationship with Jesus as well. You see, Jesus came humbly but was exalted through humility. And he came into, into, into town, riding in town. I mean, the crowds had gathered around. Lazarus had just been raised from the dead. There was something special about Jesus, and he continued to preach what it was, that he was the way, the truth, and the life, that he was the only way to God, that he could forgive sins, and that he would die in a place that we should have died. And in fact, he goes into Jerusalem, and it's a, it's a public spectacle. And again, the crowds at Friday, after he's arrested, scream crucify, and they follow him, and the, even the religious leaders and teachers figure out how we can put his blood on that cross and even have, I don't know, they didn't even care if his, their, his blood was on their hands. They didn't even care. That gift was staring them back in the face, right in the heart, and they didn't care. And then Jesus was even further elevated on the cross. He says, unless the Son of Man is raised, he can't draw them into himself. So he's, he's up there on the cross, and this is drawing hearts and attention and eyeballs to him, to the gift of God, to the mercy of God. And they still rejected him. They still rejected him. It, it, Jesus is this glaring gift to the world. And the world wants him buried and gone. But he rose from the dead, didn't he? And the disciples continued to go to their death for that gift. So that people would know that he is the gift. So when he comes to Jerusalem and he sees Jerusalem down in front of him and he's weeping over the city. Why? Because he knows he's a gift and he knows what he's about to do for them. But they will have none of it. Very few would find life through the, through the resurrection or through the death and resurrection at that, at that point. They will condemn him. They will kill him. They will want to do away with him. They will wash their hands of him. They will continue in their own sin and rebellion. And Jesus is weeping. Why? Because if this is the, the condemnation that's going to happen, the judgment that's going to happen, the people that are going to come in and destroy Jerusalem, and, and, and you could have had it differently if you would have realized who, that God had visited you, that God was in your midst, that God was here to rescue you, not to, to overpower a city or a nation, but to overpower your heart. And see, we need to give up control there. We need to let him be who he is he exposes our heart and we see him as the gift that he is and we receive that gift. We don't put him on a shelf or in a box and try to hide him away. It doesn't work. He'll continue, that box will continue to glare. It's like the thing that you try not to look at. 
and you just can't help. You're just like, oh, I'm not going to look at that. And you, you keep on looking and glancing. It's just, it's there, a glaring thing. The, it's the elephant in the room that we try to hide. But he condemns unbelief. We see in John 3, this condemnation. He says, anyone who believes in him is not condemned. So he condemns those who don't believe. He says, you should have known I was there. God visited you. You didn't recognize this time. But he says, anyone who does believe is not condemned. But anyone who does, does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judgment. Here's the judgment. Here's that glaring elephant in the room that we don't like and we try to avoid. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. You see, we don't want to embrace the gift at times because embracing the gift means walking away from our sins and our selfishness. We see in John 5, these power-hungry people are, are rebuked by him. He says, the Father who sent me has, I mean, has sent me himself, has testified about me. You, that is the Pharisees, you have not heard his voice at any time, and you have not seen his form. You don't have his word residing in you, because you don't believe the one he sent. You see, we, we think we have it all together, we think we have it all figured out, and then Jesus comes along and says, no, 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 it's not that, it's something else, I've got it figured out. No, you, you don't. You don't believe the one he sent. You pour over the scriptures because you think uh, you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. But you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. Listen, the gift of God is, is, is a huge mercy to us. And the gift of God is extended to you and to me that we would embrace Christ and have and find life. There is life in Jesus Christ. But it comes to the, the issue of our heart. Are we willing? Are we willing to embrace the gift of God? You see, it's interesting. We, uh, Jesus, we see Jesus as this great example in humanity, and he is. Jesus is a great example in humanity to follow, and we should follow him. But we should only follow him after we have received him as the merciful gift that he is. We, we can't just say, oh, I'm going to follow Jesus' example and really not have him here in our hearts at home. He is a gift, and the mercy of God is extended to us as a gift in Jesus Christ. It was Jesus poured out this mercy for us on the cross. He poured out this mercy for us as he shed his blood. Receive the gift of God. Then follow his example. And that is what it is to have life in Christ. The gift of God shows that God's mercy is more. Amen. Would you stand with me and pray? Father, thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you that you, you are the gift. And, and while you are absolutely 100% God and 100% powerful and om omnipotent and omnipresent, God, we know that you came not in power but in humility to die the death that we deserve to die. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For many of us, God, we, we've known that, and we've, we've received that, we believe that, we have life because of the Son. God, now help us to follow his example and lay down our lives, to continue to set aside our priorities and our selfishness, that we might show and shine this gift to the world. And God, we know the world doesn't even want it. Much of the world is resistant to Christ. And God, that makes us a little timid to share. But God, increase our faith, increase our courage, because there is life in no one else. There is no other name given by which we must be saved than that of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. We praise you for the gift that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.